mentor, scholar, teacher, trainer, remarkable trailblazer in the post on development space. There is no one planet like this gentleman. This man is the one and only Dr. Dennis Kimbrough. about that fine institution consolidation of two schools. Atlanta University, the old black, oldest black graduate school in the nation founded in 1865. Again, you've got speaker after speaker after speaker, so we gotta move on. Four years later, Clark College founded in 1869. You come to my office in the School of Business, you take about 400 steps to your left, you find yourself smack dab in the middle of Spelman College, founded in 1881. One of my three daughters is a Spelman sister. <laughs> you take 400 steps to your right, and you find yourself smack dab in the middle of Morehouse College. One of my three son-in-laws is a Morehouse man, but I can say with all pride, sincerity, and humility, down our halls walk some of the sharpest business students in the country, let me cut this bad boy on. I got to read you a passage taken from uh, my second book, Daily Motivations, and it really sets the tone and tenor what you just shared, talking about opportunities never being lost, and they aren't. This is titled, Where There's Hope, There's Life. At some point in life, you'll be faced with a crisis that seems so overwhelming that it will shake you to the core. A loved one dies, a marriage crumbles, disease strikes, a child goes astray, life saving is a squander, but this I know. Into each life a little rain is going to fall. In June 1992, I was diagnosed with cancer. Following surgery, I faced months of chemotherapy. Each treatment lasted four hours and left me so weak, I needed assistance just to function. I lost my appetite as well as weight. My hair, well, that came out in clumps. Being bald was the least of my worries. I had to learn to inject myself in order to keep my white blood cell count up. To be honest, full, full throttle, I didn't know that I was going to make it. I had nearly given up hope. But my hour of need, the Lord spoke to me as he so often does, and I thought, this is not the end. What can cancer do? Cancer could not control my outlook. Cancer could not steal my faith. Cancer cannot destroy my peace. Cancer cannot erase my memories. Cancer cannot invade my spirit. And it will not shatter my hope. With this hope, there's life, and I choose to live. I thank God to be able to wake up each morning and move under my own power. But if I couldn't handle it, I'm confident, if not for me, then for someone else, I could still always hope. I would instruct my doctors to give my eyes a little boy who cannot see. To give my ears to the little girl who cannot hear. Mm -hmm. To give my heart to the woman who knows nothing but pain. And to give my kidneys to the child chained to dialysis. Regardless of your circumstances, you have so much to hope for. Now, who wrote that letter? That letter was written to me by, by Marie Burnett. She wrote that letter to me more than 10 years ago. That was the centerpiece of my fourth book. My fourth book is called What Keeps Me Standing. And yes, Thinking Grow Rich of Black Choice has a piece of my heart. And yes, Daily Motivations, I guess that's my magnus opus. And yes, the Wealth Choice, well, man, that just really gets me excited. But that fourth book, What Keeps Me Standing, for a five-year period, I asked no less than 1,000 black grandmothers. And I could have focused on any demographic, but that was a demographic that was near and dearest to my heart. I asked 1,000 black grandmothers, if you could write one letter to your children or to the next generation, what would you tell them about life? 
And don't you know full throttle, I received letters from every type of black grandmother under the sun. <laughs> Doctors and lawyers to women with third and fourth grade education. Women with PhDs and MDs and JDs to those women, five, six, seventh grade education. Women whose children and grandchildren are thriving and surviving to one kind soul. And you listen to me. Her name is Flora Kelly. Check her out. She's still on the planet. She lives in Waterloo, Iowa. She has seven children, five incarcerated in prison. And she called me up when I made the request. I said, Miss Kelly, can you blah, blah? She said, Dr. Kimbrough, I, I, I don't want to write the letter, but I'm going to send you one of the letters that I sent to my boys who are incarcerated. Come to the edge, he said. They said, we are, we are afraid. Come to the edge, he said. They came, he pushed them, and they flew. Let others lead small lives, but not you. Let others cry over small hurts, but not you. Let others leave their future in someone else's hands, but not you. Well, let's get this party started right. Where do I need to point to? There we are. Can you my first slide? <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, go ahead and hit it again. Yeah. No, 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 no. Hit it again. I'll let no. I'll let you do that. <laughs> Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Well, okay, now go back. Bang, stop right there. Are we lined up? You ready to go? I wasn't going to show this. See how the Lord works? What, more than 20 years ago, I had a presentation at Stanford B School. And what do you know about Stanford B School? Right across the street from Stanford B School is SRI. Hell is SRI, students? I'm in my classroom. What is SRI full throttle? SRI is Stanford Research Institute. Why in the world is Stanford Research Institute? It's a think tank. It's a think tank, and they came up with the design, they came up with this exercise that they wanted all public speakers to use to judge and gauge the type of individuals that he or she is speaking in front of. Behind me on the screen are three symbols. I want you to choose which symbol is nearest and dearest to your mind. Which symbol is nearest and dearest to your heart, to your spirit? And this will give me some indication of what you are about. Usually your first choice is your best choice. I'll give you five seconds and under no circumstances, tell your next door neighbor. Are you ready? Yes. All right, according to SRI. Uh, how many folks pick the circle? Great, according to Stanford Research Institute, those people who pick the circle, you're very intelligent. Thanks, <laughs> There you go, girl. Give me some dap. Holla. Bang. All right. Uh, booyah. I see you. Very intelligent. How many folks pick the square? A couple of you, according to Stanford Research Institute, those individuals who chose the square, you're very creative. You don't always use your creativity, but nonetheless, you are very creative. Then I imagine the rest of the uh, full throttle chose the triangle. Let me see the folks so, Yeah. According to SRI, those people who chose the triangle, keep your hands up. Your mind is constantly preoccupied with booze and sex. Well, yeah. let's talk things in the proper perspective and let's have some fun. In 1908, there's a knock on the door and we're going to move fast because I want to pour a bunch of information into you. There's a knock on the door and who is it? None other than Napoleon Hill. Napoleon Hill was 24 years old. He was working for a nondescript magazine called Bob Taylor Magazine. You listen to me. 
And Bob Taylor Magazine, which is no longer in print right now, hired Napoleon Hill, who at the time was a part-time student at Georgetown University, trying to earn few college side hustles. So Max Dollars, how in the world they got the following interview, I will never know. Bob Taylor Magazine, you know, secured a one hour interview for Napoleon Hill with the wealthiest individual in the world. And you go ahead and do the calculus. You go ahead and look at the data. You're talking 1908, this man's picture, his likeness behind me, worth no less than $400 million. $400 million at that time. <laughs> no problem. And then you also got Bob Taylor Magazine set the interview up, and Napoleon Hill knocks on the door to Andrew Carnegie's mansion. Wow. Andrew Carnegie had a mansion on Fifth Avenue, New York, 64 rooms overlooking Central Park. He knocks on the door, Carnegie's butler goes down to the door, and there is a young, impressionable Napoleon Hill. The butler says, Mr. Carnegie's been waiting on you. Wow. Grabs Napoleon Hill by the elbow, takes him to his book line study. There were more than 3,000 books in that study. There were quotes, there were aphorisms, there was different philosophies written on the walls in his book line study. And in walks Andrew Carnegie. And the only reason why Hill and Carnegie hit it off, because so many people had interviewed Andrew Carnegie, the only reason why they connected because Napoleon Hill was trapped by all the excess. He wasn't trapped by the bling bling. He wasn't trapped by the mansion, by the cars. All of the help at his beck and call. The only thing Napoleon Hill wanted to know was the mindset of this individual to bring all of this into his life. And that hour went by so quick. And when the hour went by, Andrew Carnegie says, young man, I have a life. See, I'm, I'm really connecting with you. I'll tell you what. Why don't you stay the weekend? It was on a Friday afternoon. Stay the entire weekend, and let's take a deep dive into this subject of wealth and success. And then you can ask me any question that comes to mind. And Hill says, of course. Well, that weekend went by so fast, and here it is Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock. And the meter's running, and now it's time for Hill to leave. And before he leaves, Carnegie says, you know, young man, I'm going to offer you, you spoke about opportunity. Mm. I'm going to offer you the opportunity of a lifetime. You see that roll top desk I have over there? He says, yes, in that desk I have a black book. And in that book I've got all the contact information of all the game changers on the scene right now, and you're looking at it. I can call Thomas Edison right now. Mm. I can call Charles Goodyear. I can call Alexander Graham Bell. I can call Harvey Firestone. I can call John D. Rockefeller right now. But here's my question to you, you young man. If you are so inclined, if I could go ahead and set these interviews up with these men, these individuals, and you ask them the same questions that you just asked me, and take their response, take their information, and catalog, catalog it in a book that not only for this generation, but countless generations to come would benefit, would you do it? And supposedly, the story goes that Carnegie had a stopwatch behind his back. And it took Napoleon Hill less than 11 seconds to say yes. As a matter of fact, he said yes so quick it caught Carnegie off guard. He said, wait a minute, young man, I want you to think about this. I'm not going to pay you a dime. Oh, I'm going to reimburse you for any expenses. But I'm not going to pay you for this task. If you go ahead and do the type of job that I believe and I think you can do, that will be fortune enough. Now, will you do it? And again, Hill said yes. What was that book? That book was Law of Success. Yeah. Mm. Took Napoleon Hill more than 20 years to write Law of Success. And yes, he created his first fortune of that. Napoleon Hill wrote 16 books in his lifetime. I mean, you can go on Amazon or you can go to any bookstore and you can get, you can go ahead and buy the majority of them because even after he wrote Law of Success, he self-published a number of them. 
And there are many adaptations of his books. But you listen to me, Full Throttle. He wrote 16 books. And this was about to be number 17. Now, it's floating around here somewhere. There you go. Yep. What are you looking at? Tell everybody in existence what you're looking at. Hold it up. You might stand up and show them. The only reason why I did this, because Dell invited me. This is the first time I've done this at a presentation. That's the last 100 written pages of Napoleon Hill that she's holding. Did you hear what I said? I see it. That's his Hamilton typewriter. 100 pages of Napoleon Hill. That's it. I guess I should have it safe deposit box, but I don't. You can take the binder off there and you can pass it around. Now, why would I show you that? Because when I got my fancy PhD degree, I went around the country interviewing successful African Americans. And I wrote down on my first sheet of paper 50 names. I went out and I interviewed those individuals. Then I wrote another 50 names. I went out and interviewed those individuals. Then I wrote another 50 names. I quit counting on 150 interviews where word got around what I was doing and I just flew home for interviewing Earl Graves, the publisher of Black Enterprise Magazine. And my wife says, man, you gotta go upstairs and check your answer machine. I mean, some guy keeps calling and calling and calling. I said, who is it? Go up there and find out. I'm taking my tie off, throwing my jacket across the bed. I hit the button and there was a message on there. Young man, my name is W. Clement Stone. I live in Chicago. I am the president of the Napoleon Hill Foundation. I heard about you. When can you come to Chicago? I would like to meet you. Well, the next day I returned the phone call. He asked me to come to Chicago. It took me, me and my wife 10 days minimum to scrounge the money for a hotel and for airfare and for a rental car. We landed on the airport, drive over to his palatial office. My wife waited in the rental car right outside the office. It was November 3rd, 1986. I was in year three of my task. And there I walk into his office. He's surrounded by his sea of lieutenants. And I walk into his personal office, sit right at him at his mahogany desk. And W. Clement Stone, uh, Stone has a bright flowered bow tie, smoking one of his signature Havana cigars. <laughs> and he says, young, young man, you know, you're not the first person to go around the country and you're doing successful African Americans. And I said, I'm not. And he said, no. He says, Napoleon Hill was doing this at the time of his death. I said, you've got to be kidding. We have a proposition for you. I said, what is that, Mr. Stone? We want you to finish, complete, and update a book. I said, what book? He reached across his credenza, pulled out a, from his credenza the last 100 written pages of Napoleon Hill, dropped it on my lap just like I dropped it on your desk. He says, that book. I said, well, I'm honored, Mr. Stone, but I can't do that. He said, why not? I said, I'm writing a book of my own. He said, young man, if you have any sense, you need to put your book and finish this. Right, right, right. <laughs> and then number two. I leveled up. I said, Mr. Stone, even if I wanted to do it, I gotta be honest with you, I'm dead broke. I couldn't find a quarter with the roadmap. <laughs> yeah, I got a fancy degree, but I'm living off my wife's earning as an accountant. She's in a rental car right outside your office. I'm about to lose my house, Mr. Stone. If you would go ahead and give me some type of financial support, I will certainly take on that task. And he said to me, no, I'm not going to give you any money. Andrew Carnegie didn't give, you know, Napoleon Hill a dime. But if you want to find the answers to those questions, why one person succeeds while another fails, mm. why one individual is rich and wealthy while another is impoverished, it is in this laboratory that you must find it. Wow. <laughs> but I'm going to do you a favor, young man. I'm going to give you a medallion. I'm going to give you an item that I've given to all my friends and peak performers. And whoever I've given this medallion to, they have never, ever failed to reach their goals and objectives. Hold out your hand, young man. And I held out my hand, and this is what W. Clement Stone placed in my hand. Wow. It's a coin with his likeness on it, and it says W. Clement Stone. And on the back, it's got positive mental attitude Woo! with the words, do it now. You don't know how many times 
I thrown this up against the wall. You know how many times I was about to throw it in the woods? That's right. I don't care. I mean, some of you are crying and this is your testimonial. And I can fully understand. He did say it is in this laboratory. You got so many success experts out there and saying this and writing that. I'm not knocking that. But it's the one thing to talk about it. And listen, damn it, it's another thing to live it. Come on. Right. Come on. To right. live it. Yes, sir. I didn't get one car repossessed. I got two. The second anybody have a car repossessed? My youngest daughter was nine years old when that sheriff came to the house, knocked on the door, and whoever answered the door, they placed the citation in that individual's hand. And the sheriff knocks at the door, and my young daughter, the one that finished with spelling with nine years old, opens up the door, they place the citation in her hand. She brings her, Dad, she called him a policeman. The policeman wanted you to have this while I'm looking out the window, and there's my Honda on the back of a flatbed truck. I can't begin to tell you lights, water, electricity cut off. Twice I had my water cut off. The second time they cut it off, they cut it off on a Friday. Mm. I couldn't go to the water company the Monday. And you talking about they cutting this off for five. Five hours is nothing. <laughs> it's nothing. Right. And what am I ashamed about? Because I had to lie to my daughters, my three girls. My three daughters, I looked them in the eye and I lied to them. Dad, what's wrong with the water? I said, well, they're out there working on the pipes. Mm. <laughs> I wasn't man enough to tell them that Dad dropped the ball. Mm. And that night I cried on my wife's shoulder and I prayed on her lap. And she said, what are you going to do? I said, Monday, Pat, I'm going to just go down there. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to go down there and I'm going to tell them the situation. Now, the second time they cut your water off, they attach a surcharge to it. $65. You listen to me. This is at what, mid 1980s? I didn't even have the money to pay the bill, let alone the $65. So Monday morning, 9 o'clock, I go down to the Cab County, Georgia Water Company. Right there on the corner of Claremont and what, Commerce Avenue? Indicator, Georgia. It's still there. And I went in there, and the line is from here, what? <laughs> What, North Georgia? I mean, everybody's there. You go get a number. And they got three cubicles. They got old 1960s Social Security furniture, and they got three agents with old computers and blah, blah, blah. Glass partitions between the three. One was a black female. And I said, if I'm going to bear my soul, maybe, just maybe, she just might understand. And I positioned myself in the line where she would call. I'm not knocking anybody else. That was in my spirit. That's why I read you that letter from those grandmothers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a connection that I said, so we'll go ahead and get it. So I'm moving in the line, blah, blah, blah. The line is moving. And I see where she wouldn't call me. And somebody, and I let somebody behind me. Oh, you go right ahead. You take my spot. <laughs> and I get back in line. And I maneuver and navigate and blah, blah, blah. And this, that, and everything. And I had my number. And she called my number. And as God is my witness. As I'm standing here right now. She was on the end cubicle. And I walked into her office and I got down on one knee in her office. My self-image was so low I couldn't even make eye contact with this woman. I said, you won't understand. I know you're looking. My name is Dennis Kimberly. Go ahead, pull my number up, pull my information up. I know I'm behind and I know I owe you money. But I got this big dream and I spent every dime and penny robbing Peter to pay Paul to go ahead and finish this book. Hell, I don't know if anybody's ever going to read this book, but I think it's going to make a difference. And if you help me this one time, I will never ask for your help and support again. And what did she do? What did she do, full throttle? She looked to her left. She looked to her right. She hit a few keys on that keyboard and erased my count clean. Clean. But it's not for her erasing my account, it's what she said to me. 
After she looked to the left and to the right and erased my account, she said, I won't tell if you won't. Now pick up your bed and go walk. I said, you won't believe it. You see, that was the universe yesterday. I don't know if you got the message what Dell told you. You can go ahead and look at my book bag. I wrote it down. He says, what you want wants you. Yeah. What you're looking for, well, damn it, it's looking for you. Yeah. All you've got to do is fulfill your place. All you've got to do is show up. If you show up, you'll be 80% of the competition. If you show up on time, <laughs> you'll be 85% of the competition. If you show up on time with a plan, you'll be 90% of the competition. If you show up on time, on time with a plan and a commitment to carry it out, you'll be 95% of the competition. But Lord have mercy, full throttle. If you show up on time with a plan and a commitment to carry it out, and damn it, then execute it. You'll make the cover of Time Magazine. It doesn't take much to succeed. So there you are, I'm thinking, Grow Rich of Black Choice, and I'm honored and a wealth choice, and best sellers in this, that, and everything. Well, we got to move right along. Martin Luther King said it all. Your life is officially over the day you been, begin to talk about and think about and discuss everything that doesn't matter. Kimberly, what matters? Your goals, your dreams, your visions. There's Nelson Mandela fighting for his last breath. And he's on a bed and he's got all his lieutenants around him. And he's about to make his transition right in front of our very eyes. And a young journalist wants one last interview, one last question. And Mandela looks up from the bed and sees him and his guards holding his arms out and saying, no, you can't go in there, Nelson's too safe. And Mandela's waiting. Let him in, let him in. And the journalist goes up to Mr. Mandela. I know the hour is long, but I just got one last question. Mandela says, sure, young man, what is it? He said, what is the purpose of life? And Mandela said, the only way I can answer that question is to be Socratic, is to ask you a question. <laughs> you want to find the purpose of life? He said, yes. Well, let me ask you a question. Have you moved from fear to fearless? Yeah. Have you? Have you moved from fear to fearless? Fear knocks on the door and faith answered. I moved from fear to fearless. Napoleon Hill tells you the only reason why Napoleon Hill came up with 17 principles. Listen to me, Paul Throttle. The top four, definiteness of purpose, mastermind, applied faith, going the extra mile. The only reason why he came up with pleasing personality to cosmic habit force is to get you to focus on those first four. Definiteness of purpose, mastermind, applied faith. Faith isn't faith until it's applied. Going the extra mile. That's a burning desire. Hell, if I asked you, categorize what you do for a living. Would you tell me that it's work? Would you tell me that it's hard? Would you tell me that it's drudgery? Would you tell me, oh, girl, I just can't stand it. I just got to Well, hopefully you'll tell me that it's your life mission. Hopefully that you'll tell me that you have a passion for it. Hopefully you'll tell me, you know, that's my ministry. If you tell me that it's your ministry and you're passionate about it, then the word conviction is going to be applied to what you're saying. Amen. And what do we know about the passionate, convicted, committed mind? Mm. It cannot be defeated. Mm. It cannot be defeated. I wouldn't be standing here if it could be defeated. I didn't have squat but a dream, a vision, and I had conviction and nothing was going to stop. People ask me all the time, Dr. Kimbra, what is the difference between the individual who goes to college, gets his degree, works in corporate America, after five years gets sick and tired of corporate America, and finally says, I had enough of this, I'm going to go ahead and start my business. He starts his business, and after six months, no one is using this product, no one is using this service, the bills are coming to due. He's about to lose his car. He's about to lose his house. And before losing his car and losing his house, he blows the dust off his resume and jumps back into corporate America. Mm. 
What is the difference between that individual and the other individual who you know goes to college, gets his degree, works on corporate America, after a year or so say, I'm sick of this, I'm gonna go out there and jump it, start my own business, and uh, after six months, no one is using the product, no one's using the service, getting behind on his rent, getting behind on his mortgage, about to lose the car, and says, doesn't blow the dust off his resume, says, take the house, take the car. What is the difference between the two individuals? Fearless. One individual is afraid of losing the house or the car. The other individual is afraid of losing his or her life. That was me. Woo. Woo. I couldn't go back in there. I couldn't go back in there. Oh, I'm going to finish this story. I told the folks last night after we had a little breakout locker room session, the turning point. I mean, year two, I saw where this was going with it. Okay, I was a pharmaceutical sales rep. And I'm gonna get to my presentation. I was a pharmaceutical sales rep. I was the first black male. I was the first black male in the rotational program for Smith, Klein, and French Pharmaceuticals. My first tour of duty was manufacturing up in Philadelphia. After a year and a half in Philadelphia, they sent us to Atlanta, Georgia, and I was carrying the bag. I was a hospital rep. But by then, I was working on my book. And so, I was working a territory near my house and I said, do I want to eat at McDonald's or fast food or do I want to, you know, swing by the house and get leftovers that we had last night? And I said, let me go by the house. And don't you know, when I was in the house eating my lunch, working in corporate, the phone rings. And who was it that was on there? Who was that that called me? Who was on the phone? It was John Johnson of Ebony Magazine. Number one on my list. Not his secretary. Not his administrative assistant, wow. not his chief of staff, it was Mr. Johnson. See, we didn't have any caller ID, any call waiting, none of that. And when my wife got home, I said, Pat, man, you won't believe what happened, man. And I'm wondering how many other phone calls I might have missed and blah, blah, blah. So we had to come to Jesus. That night, we had to come to Jesus. And I promised her, I said, Pat, it won't take long. You just hang in there and blah, 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 and this, that, and the other. Well, took another five years. Took another five years. And so here we are. You're, they're going back to, you know, that question, that uh, going back to uh, uh, Nelson Mandela, have you moved from fear to fearless? Number two, what Mandela said. Number one, have you moved from fear to fearless? And number two, have you closed the gap? between your potential and your performance. Wow. Have you? Have you closed the gap? Look, boys and girls, look full throttle. You live the normal life. What the hell is a normal life? 74, 77 years on Earth. That's a normal life. Do the calculus. I mean, that comes down, that equates to 30,000 days on Earth. That, that comes down to 4,000 weeks. Baby girl, that's all you get. Time is not running out, but your life is. And what is the key entrepreneurial question? The key entrepreneurial question, what are you gonna do with the rest of life that you have left? Yeah. Steve Jobs says, when are you gonna poke a hole in the universe and prove you were here? Well, that, this is Napoleon Hill stuff, but I definitely wanna show you this because I know that we've got to move on. This is taken from the wealth choice. We're gonna talk about wealth and we're gonna talk about professional development. Those are five keys taken from the Wealth Club. Remember, I asked you the first one. This is what I found from these individuals. Number one, they were driven. When I asked that question, how would you categorize what you do for a living, they were driven. These individuals couldn't be stopped. Steve Harvey, what in the world did Steve Harvey tell me? Steve Harvey even spoke in my class, poured into my students, my kids. And what did he tell me and my students? A career is what you're paid for, but a calling is what you're made for. Steve Harvey was nine years old when he had career day in school. He was nine years old, career day, fourth grade, where every student had to walk up to the front of the class and tell your classmates what you're going to do when you grow up, what you're going to do for a living. And a little girl in Steve's class goes, I'm going to be a school teacher. Little Johnny goes to the front of the class, I'm going to be a fireman. And the teacher says, okay, Steve, it's your turn. Steve walks to the front of the class, tell everybody what you're going to do, Steve. Steve says, I'm going to be on TV. And the teacher was incensed. 
Said, Steve, you always acting a fool. You're always cutting up in my class. Tell your classmates what you're really going to do. And Steve says, yes, I really am going to be on TV. The teacher says, I will not hear of it. Steve, go sit down. And I want you to think about your answer all weekend because I'm going to call on you the first thing Monday morning, and I better not hear any nonsense about you being on TV. What in the world did Steve Harvey do? He went over and told his mother. And his mother had the presence of mind to send her son to his bedroom, same thing I did, with a legal sheet of paper and told him to write his life goals and look at him first thing in the morning and last thing before he goes to bed at night. That was Napoleon Hill. Wow. That's Napoleon Hill. Mother didn't even know. But using the same process, Napoleon Hill, you go get Think and Grow Rich and there are six steps that he'll send you through. Those steps won't fail. Don't reinvent the wheel. He says, I'm going to be on TV that he did that at age nine, and you look at Harvey right now. I interviewed Steve Harvey twice. The second time I interviewed him, two hours in his palatial offices, Buckhead, Atlanta, Georgia. And I go into his palatial office, his uh, administrative <laughs> assistant meets me at the door, takes me by the elbow. Dr. Kimber, you've been in Steve's office before. Yes, I have. Takes me there. He's wrapping up a meeting. He'll be with you shortly. And for those of you who ever had an opportunity to see his office, his office is about the size of this room. <laughs> wall to wall, TV to TV <laughs> monitor, 60-inch TVs on every corner of all three walls and his, you know, desk and blah, 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 his monitor there. So you got nothing but flat screen TVs looking all different. And on those TVs, what is he looking at? Is he looking at game shows? Hell no. Is he looking at videos? No. What in the world is he looking at on these flat screen TVs, full throttle? His life goals. And I'm sitting there, his admin comes back and says, Steve is so mad. He's, he's so ashamed because he had this interview on the schedule and he was really looking forward to Dr. Kimbrough. Just give him a few more minutes. He's wrapping up this meeting. Would you like a Coke? Would you like water? I said, no, I'm fine. Tell Steve, take as much time. But before you leave, I feel like I'm a fly on the wall. I'm looking at some proprietary information. Obviously, these are his life's goals. And the one goal that's right in front of me to be worth $350 million by X amount of time is, is that part of this life goal? And she says, yes. I said, how capable, how close is he to hitting that $350 million? And what did she tell me? Already did it. Yeah. He already she said, if he doesn't do it in two years, he will definitely do it in three. Mm -hmm. And that was before he took the family feud job. Wow. That was Napoleon Hill, not an easy path. Not an, and don't you tell me this nonsense about the Lord, about God testing you. God doesn't test you. Why in the world would God want to test you? God gave you the drink. Yeah. There is nothing presumptuous. There is nothing precocious about your creator. Well, who in the world is testing you? That's your old greasy ego self-doubt. <laughs> tell doubt to go to hell, man. He gave you the dream. He gave you the vision. Not an easy path. Here I am with Damon John, and I said, Damon, what was the high water mark in your life? He said, what do you mean? When you don't know if you're going to sink or swim, and you don't know whether you're going to fail or succeed. And he said, obviously, it had to be the time that I burned down the furniture. I said, what do you mean, burn down the furniture? He said, when I finally got financing from Samsung, they gave me $80,000 to you know, go ahead and launch my FUBU apparel line. Well, the first thing I did was hire all these seamstresses and they showed up at my mother's house and I had no place to put my mother's uh, furniture. Ooh. I said, well, what did you do? I took all the furniture out of my mother's house, put it in the backyard and set it on fire. Oh. Well, when are you gonna burn the furniture? Ooh. That's a metaphor. Several times I burned the furniture when everybody knew what I was doing with this book. Took priority, sorry. Sorry. Not an easy pair, think outside the box. And again, going what David John said, he said, Dr. Kimbrough, it is not how far you can see. It's how clearly you can see. Think outside the box. Average individual in our lifestyle gets four ideas a year. Any one of which, if you have the guts, the courage, the fortitude to chase your dream, 
will make you financially independent. Wow. Think outside the box. You can't be Matumbo. You can't be Matumbo. No, 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 no. <laughs> Got a chance to interview him. And yes, he spoke in my class also. Wow. And he wrapped up, he told my students, he said, well, since you're business students, you probably want to know the size of my portfolio. And my student says, yes. He says, I have no problem sharing that with you. And he says, yes, I own oil wells in Nigeria. And yes, I own a couple of schools in Nigeria. And yes, I own a clinic, and I'm about to finish place the finishing touches on a hospital in Nigeria. And yes, I own a railway system in Nigeria. But that's not the flagship of my portfolio. And my students were, well, Mr. Matumbo, what is the flagship of your portfolio? And then he said the following. He said, I don't care, for those of you who've been to Atlanta, Georgia, this hits home. He said, I don't care what hospital you go to in Atlanta, Georgia. I don't care if you go to Northside. I don't care if you go to Crawford Long. I don't care if you go to Emory. I don't care if you go to Piedmont. I don't care if you go to South Fulton. I don't care if you go to Hillendale. I don't care what hospital you go to in Atlanta, Georgia. I own the ambulance service at that wow. hospital. Wow. And he says, how did that occur? He said, I wasn't even thinking about it until my mother died in my arms. I had to fly back to Nigeria. And as my mother is dying in my arms, the last question she asked me is, what will be your legacy? Oh, wow. What will be your legacy? So he says, yes, I played 16 years in the NBA, and yes, I have a sizable net worth and everything. And some of the guys that I played with, they squandered all the money, and they declared bankruptcy, and they're dead broke. And yes, they do ask me for money. And the first time they ask me for money, I don't loan it to them. I give it to them. But the second time that they ask me for money, I don't give them a dime. I give them something more important. I said, what is that, Deke? He said, I give them a book. I give them a book, do more than what is expected, more than what is acquired. You do what is expected, you get a paycheck, Simon Bale, if you go above and beyond what is expected, and you get opportunity. Amen. And you get opportunity. And then last but not least, make things happen. The reason why, I said Napoleon Hill wrote 16 books, number 17 was going to be a black choice. Of all his books, my favorite is The Master Key to Riches. That was his next to last book. Now why is The Master Key to Riches my favorite of all Napoleon Hill's works, more so than thinking we're rich? Because he finally tells the world to him and his mindset. And the Napoleon Hill that wrote Law of Success was not the Napoleon Hill that wrote those 100 pages. He had transformed, I have no problem saying this. I shared with a few folks off to the side about Napoleon Hill. When he wrote Law of Success, it took him more than 20 years to write that book. He went from dead broke to off the meter in terms of wealth. And what was the first thing he did? He was still a young guy. He was in his early 40s. He didn't buy one Rolls Royce, he bought two. <laughs> now Andrew Carnegie had gone on to glory but many of the individuals who Napoleon Hill interviewed, who they poured into Napoleon Hill, told them all about success, leadership, and achievement, and they saw what Hill did with his money. They grabbed Hill by the back of the collar of his shirt and says, young man, didn't you learn anything in those 20 years? Wow. You got rid of one of the cars. <laughs> He'd been married three times. One was wise up taking the court to pay alimony. So he was a different individual between law of success and the guy that left those 100 pages. Seems like he got the touch of glory on him. So here it is, he wrote this. This is success according to Napoleon Hill. And we always throw a dollar figure on success. You can't do that. It's different for different people. And Hill says it is a six-pointed star, and you can judge, you can gauge where you are in life by the various points of the star that you've incorporated in your life. Top of the list is peace of mind. Mm -hmm. And again, according to Hill, what is peace of mind? The absence of all negative emotions, fear, anger, jealousy, hatred, guilt, greed. And to the extent that you have peace of mind, you have riches, you have success, and you are worthy of abundance. 
Peace of mind. What does the Bible say? Blessed are the peacemakers. Amen. Well, that doesn't mean that me and Dell, we had a fist fight and then we hug and make up and shake hands. It doesn't mean that. When the Bible says blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are those with peace of mind. We see folks right now, oh girl, I couldn't believe they committed suicide. They had everything. No, baby girl, they didn't have everything. Right, right, right. And I've been around a bunch of folks who on the outside, you were thinking, mm -mm, mm -mm. I got one of the folks in the book, man, talking about their kids and this, that, mm -mm, no, no. Blessed are the peacemakers, health and energy. You won't have peace of mind if your body is ravaged by pain, if your body is ravaged by disease. And according to Hill, what is disease? It's dis-ease. It's a lack of ease. I shared with a number of folks last night, okay, between the World Health Organization and the CDC, they track 10,400 diseases on a daily basis. Not one of those diseases was created by your almighty. Yeah. Didn't create it. Who created it? You did. Mm -hmm. You did. More than 50% of all diseases caused by the lack of adequate drinking water. Maybe that's the reason why the Lord blew breath into your lungs so you go to Bangladesh and dig a well for somebody. <laughs> you don't know. You don't know. I was on a family vacation, man, with my girls, my wife and girls, and we were in Florida, and we were kicking it. And we were all out in the deep ocean. First thing I did when you know y'all, you got to teach them girls to swim. They go on spring breaks and all types of crazy stuff. All excellent swimmers, and we were out in the deep part. While we're out there frolicking, man, my uh, youngest daughter, the one that finished the phone, comes over to me and says, Dad, man, do you hear him here? Who is it? Turn over there. There's a guy drowning out there. And I said, man, I ain't got time to swim back and get the lifeguard, man. Let me go ahead and bust the move. And I swam over to him. I said, God says, sir, don't, don't you do nothing. You just turn your back, and I will bring you back on your back. And I got him there, and they helped him on the shore and this, that, and everything. Why am I sharing the story with you? That might have been the only reason why the Lord blew breath into my lungs. Not the book, but to save the life of another. Mm -hmm. You don't know. Right. Look, Dan, sometimes you're not in a position to reach back. But if you can't reach back, make sure that you reach over. You are here, man. You are here to pass that baton. I interviewed John Johnson in Ebony Magazine twice. The second time that I interviewed him, he just threw it up in my face because we had a little relationship and he knew what I was about. That's why I gave him the second interview. And he says, man, why, why are you wasting your time going around the country interviewing folks? I said, I got you, Mr. Johnson. He said, you don't have to do that. I said, well, what do you want me to do, Mr. Johnson? He said, if you want to find the keys to success and leadership, all you've got to do is look at a relay race. I said, what do you mean look at a relay race? He said, a relay race isn't one or loss in how fast the runners are. A relay race is one or loss in how capable one runner can pass that baton from one to the next. And then he went on to say, we got fast runners in this lane, this lane, blah, blah, blah. They've come down the final turn, coming down the straightaway, holding this baton called success, leadership, and achievement. And we have to make sure that the next generation is fit, focused, ready to run the race of their life. <laughs> Loving relationships. Loving relationships. Two types of love. And when I say loving relationships, I'm not talking in a narcissistic way. I'm not talking conceited way. I'm talking about love of yourself yes, that you are deserving and you are worthy. What was going through my mind when I went through the transformation yesterday? Love of yourself. There are two types of love. You got filial love, which is built on convenience, kind of, sort of, like when it's convenient. Oh, girl, I love you in the morning if you do A, B, C, X, Y, Z. And then you've got agape love, which is completely unconditional love. Agape love. And we see it all the time, man. We see those two forms of love. Ladies, what's the greatest psychic need of a man? You don't even know. The greatest psychic need of a man is to think that his thoughts and his hopes and, you know, you know his concerns are being considered. And you do it to us all the time. I mean, my wife would come in a magazine, and she said, now, do you like this color or that color? Oh, Pat, I like that color. I knew you were going to say that. I think we'll go with this. <laughs> <laughs> my daughter's doing it to my son-in-law's. Now, 
Which chair do you like? Do you like that chair or this chair? Oh, the McKenzie, I like that chair. I knew you were gonna say that. I think we'll move in this direction. <laughs> It's not that you, you know, you go ahead and, and choose to and select the, the one that we point out. No. It's just that our hopes and dreams and aspirations are being considered. That's all we want. Now, men, what's the greatest cycle need of a woman? Men. You don't even know. The greatest cycle need of a woman is to be safe and secure. It's to be safe and secure. Sometimes only the the only thing a woman wants is to walk in the house and hear a man's voice. That's all she wants. It's to be safe and secure. And we violate that. Oh man, you stepped on my Air Jordans, pull out your Glock. You act the fool out in public. We violate that all the time when the Lord wants to take a true measure of a man. He doesn't put the tape around the shoulders, he puts the tape around the heart. It's not the bass in your voice or how much hair on your chest. How bulging your muscles, how hard you can hit. It's not how hard you can hit. It's how light and tender you can be to the touch. That's the greatest psychic need. Now, why do I share that? Because you can ask, remember I said filial love, kind of, sort of, when I want something. Versus agape love. You got, what, 40 different firehouses in Atlanta, Georgia. You go to any firefighter, and they will tell you, that if a home is on fire, a building's on fire, when the fuck you know, when the father gets there and the firefighter says, "Sir, you can't go in there," and he says, "But my children are in there, sir. It's too dangerous. You can't go in there." Firefighter sticks out his arm. The father looks at the burning house, knows his kids are in there, shakes his head, turns around, and walks back. But you let the mother get there. Ask the firefighter if you don't believe me. <laughs> Ma'am, I'm sorry, you can't go. My children are in there. Ma'am, it's too dangerous. Firefighter puts out the arm, what does a mother do? Removes his arm. Yeah. Now you got folks that'll doubt that. Well, evidently you didn't see that mother who had those two kids in that school in Uvalde, Texas. You didn't see that? My, my brother, 30 years law enforcement, he was captain of New Jersey State Police, he'll tell you. You had 19 police officers in Uvalde, Texas, in that school, in the hallway, loaded to the gills. They had the AR-15, they had the clock, they had the ammo, they had body armor, 19 of them. But we're frozen. And you had a mother get up there with two of her kids in that school, and she's walking into the school, and one of the officers, man, where are you going? Said, my kids are in there. She said, no, they, they said, you can't go in there. She said, I'm going in there. And then one of the police officers will let me escort you. She turned around and said, you don't have to escort me. She went in there and got her kids. That's right. Go to Barnum and Bailey. Go to the circus. Any lion tamer will tell you that the mama bear the mama tiger, the mama lion, will let you do anything you want. Stick your head in the mouth of the bear, stick your head in the mouth of the lion, the lion will jump through the fiery hoops. I'll do anything you want, but don't you dare touch my cubs. Don't you touch my babies. That's agape love. And what is at the heart of agape love? Because I even did a reel on this. What is the one question that only the female species asks, which is the most important question in the universe? That only the species, the female species, ask this question. What is the most important question in the universe? It's what about the children? Yeah. Right. No one else that, but women. What about the children? What did John Johnson tell me? Passing the baton from one generation to the next. So when you ask the question, what about the children? That means you're ready to pass the baton. There's somebody else besides you on this planet. That's loving relationships. That Hill was talking about financial freedom, financial independence, different for different people. We are coming down the home stretch, financial freedom and financial independence. Now we live in a society right now with social media and everything going on right now. Oh, you gotta be banks like Hank, and I don't tell people you gotta be a millionaire, you gotta be financially, I don't do that. All I do tell my readers, I just wanna see you personally fulfilled. Amen. Yeah. Whatever that dollar figure is. You ask my mother, God bless us all, what is your level of financial freedom and financial independence? She said, well, if I could just find 50 extra dollars a month. Mm -hmm. 
She'll be financially. That's your level of financial freedom. The first time anybody ever told me that they wanted to be a billionaire is when I interviewed Don King. I flew up to Cleveland, Ohio, spent a day with Don King, the fight promoter. And we were talking about goals. And I said, Mr. King, what is your number one goal? He said, I'll be black America's first, you know, black billionaire. Well, he wasn't the first. Who was it? It was Bob Johnson. It was Bob Johnson of BET. Worthy goals and ideals. If you don't have a goal, I need to know why you don't have a goal. Do you even know your area of excellence? Do you? Do you know your area of excellence? What is your value add? You know, we're, we're talking like you're in B school right now. What is your area of excellence? As you know, there are eight laws of branding and the number one law of branding is the law of leadership. Where do you lead the field? You'd be surprised, man, before I would get a phone call, can Dr. Kimbrough speak on this? Can Dr. Kimbrough speak on that? No, I, I, I can't let somebody else do that. What is my area of excellence? If anybody wants to know anything about leadership, if anybody wants to know about wealth, anything wants, anybody wants to know anything about success, yeah, I should be a part of the conversation. That's my area of excellence. You ask yourself three critical questions to find your area of excellence. Number one, what do you love to do? What do you have a passion for? What can you throw your whole heart and soul into? What did Henry David Thoreau say? Don't die with your music left in you. Old rapper, too short, been way too long, time for the whole world to play your song. It's when I walk in the classroom, those 70 to 80 students in the classroom, well, damn it, they're gonna sing my song. Amen. This is what I was born to do. I shared with a number of you, I'm a sophomore, undergrad, college, University of Oklahoma, my fraternity brothers called me the professor because I always had a book on the mind. I knew what I wanted to do. Well, what do you love to do? What do you have a passion for? What can you throw your whole heart and soul into? So many times when I'm interviewing folks, I couldn't tell when they were working, when they were playing. It was completely and totally symmetrical. I don't care whether it was Tyler Perry, I don't care whoever. I couldn't tell when they were working, when they were playing. Question number two, what would you do for free? If no one ever gave you a dime, if no one ever gave you financial reward for your efforts, what would you do for free? I proved it. Mr. Stone, if you would give me some type of financial support, I would, didn't give me squat. <laughs> and because he didn't give me squat, he gave me everything. Do you know what I would have missed out of if he did write me a check for $100,000? I wouldn't be able to stand up here. I wouldn't, be able, I wouldn't be able to express empathy like I did last night when we were up in the hotel room and one of the participants crying. I wouldn't be able to feel that. But I know how that feels because I shared that story when I did the same thing. We were at the five we were at the five month mark. We had passed the five month mark without paying our mortgage. We were like in between month seven and eight. And don't you know the mortgage holder, the bank sent photographers out to take pictures of the property. And I knew that we had lost two cars. So I knew the house was gone. And me and my wife cried like a baby. But I cried a little bit more. And she said, she said, well, let me rationalize, man. Let me, let me be strategic now to think what's going on. And she said to me, we got to get out of this house. And I said, where are we going to go, Pat? She said, well, I don't, I don't care where we go. We got to get out of this house. Let's go out to dinner. And I said, dinner, girl, you, you got money or something? Huh? Come on, man, what are we going to do? I said, who's going to give us money for dinner? She said, I'm going to give myself money for dinner. I said, how are you going to do that? And I'll tell you, hey, connect the dots. All right, so she writes a hot chip. We went to a Chinese restaurant. Lowest point in the seven years, I am telling you right now. For me, went to a Chinese restaurant, and there I am crying in my beer, talking about, well, this might be the last night we get a chance to spend in this house. How am I going to tell the girls that we just lost the house? So after the Chinese food, they bring the bill and they bring the fortune cookie. <laughs> and we pay the bill, she pays the bill, and she opens up her fortune cookie, and I look at her and I said, what does your fortune say? And she shares it with me, and I can't remember some vague stuff, blah, blah, blah. And she says to me, she says, and what does your fortune say? And I cracked open the cookie, and I looked at it, and it was some nonsense. 
And she said, what does it say? And I'm just shaking my head. She said, what does it say? And I said, I said, this is not my portion. You don't need to know. So what did I do? I went around to every table at that restaurant and if patrons did, left their fortunes right on the table, I picked them up and read them until I found my fortune. Yeah, if they left cookies that were uncracked and, and closed and weren't open, I cracked them right there. My wife says, fool, they're going to get security. The, uh, the, guy, the waiters are going to get you out of here. And a couple waiters just say, sir, what are you doing? I said, I'm looking for my fortune. I went around every single table until and Pat was there by the cashier. And I was in the corner at some table. And I held it up. And I read it. I said, Pat, I found my fortune. I was yelling. Blah, blah, blah. You don't know when you get to that point. You don't know what you'll do when you get to that transformational point. And that was my transformational point. Yes. And I look at that, and I read that, and I read that, and I held on to that fortune. And as soon as I got home, I went down to my study, and I pulled out my Bible, and I opened up my Bible to the first page, and I got a piece of scotch tape, and I take that fortune right there. We're talking 1988, right there in my Bible. And what did that fortune say? said, you will be surrounded by warmth and riches. Right. That was it. That was a high water mark for me. Good. Worthy goals and ideals, and last but not least, according to Hill, sense of meaning and purpose. Stop to smell all the roses along the way. Appreciate the moment. Appreciate the journey. Appreciate what you are doing, taking action on your goals and on your visions. Don't have time for that, but I can leave everything back here with Dell. Don't you know that Steve Jobs and Martin Luther King used the same marketing strategy to reach their goals and objectives? You didn't even know that. You probably want to write it down. What is the marketing strategy? Number one, tell me where we are. Number two, tell me where we can be. And number three, make it that way. Dr. King, tell me where we are. This country wrote a black man a check that came back marked insufficient funds, okay? Steve Jobs, tell me where we are. Well, if you're like me, you probably got 50 million different electronic gadgets on you that are cumbersome and you can't keep up with all of them. All right. Number two, tell me where we can be. Well, Dr. King, tell me what we can be. Yeah, this country wrote us a check that came back marked insufficient funds, but I had a dream that my four children were judged by the character, not by the color of their skin. All right, great. Steve Jobs, tell me what we can be. Yeah, I got 50 million gadgets on me just like you do, but I called my product design engineers into my office and my system engineers, and I said, wouldn't it be great if we could take all these gadgets and put it on one device? All right. And number three, the last one, make it that way. Dr. King, make it that way. Yeah, hey, we've got to check mark insufficient funds, but I had a dream that my four children would be measured by the character, not the color of their skin. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. Steve Jobs, make it that way. Yeah, I have 50 million gadgets, but they put it all on one device. April 2007, ladies and gentlemen, introducing the iPhone the same marketing strategy. The same marketing strategy. Listen to me, entrepreneurs. All you need, number one, is a method. Number two, you need a model. Somebody that can pour into you, somebody that can coach you. They may not even know that you're modeling them. And then last but not least, a mechanism. And if you employ those three strategies, what will you do, entrepreneurs? You will transform a problem into profitable. That's all that entrepreneurs do. That's entrepreneurship, not income replacement. Those are some of the individuals that I interviewed, blah, blah, blah. I had more than 60. You recognize some of the faces on there, the game changers, as we close out the seven laws of wealth. Seven laws of wealth. What separates me? This is an empirical study. I used a full-blown survey, and I have no problems you know, sharing that survey with you. I asked these millionaires 118 questions. Anonymous. Some of them signed it. Some of them you know, mailed it back to me with their business card. Some of them handed it to me. 
They got a hold of me. Here's my survey. I don't want to know. I don't, I don't even know him. Why? Because the second section of that survey is on their financials, and I asked some proprietary information. But they shared it with me. Number two, besides the survey, I had six focus groups around the country. You weren't African American and you weren't seven figures. Well, maybe we need to talk another time. But I had six focus groups around the country. I had a huge one in Washington, D.C., three in Atlanta, one in Omaha, Nebraska, and one with just black females in Las Vegas. Wow. And then last but not least, 60 face-to-face -face interviews. Now, I made the distinction up front, I didn't want any athletes, I didn't want any entertainers. Why? Because we were overrepresented in that area. But obviously, as you see, there were some entertainers I had to interview. I had to interview. People ask me all the time, any of the interviews really stick out? Yeah, as we close this puppy up and I'm about to shut it down right now. No ego here, we're ready for the next speaker. But there I am, man, with T.D. Jakes. And I met T.D. Jakes several times, but I really, need, I really didn't have a deep dive interview with him. And what do you know about T.D. Jakes? Well, like Tyler Perry and a few other folks, he never finished, like Martin Luther King, never finished high school. T.D. Jakes dropped out of high school. Mm. Number two, they ran him out of Charleston, West Virginia with eight members. Mm. Number three, I mean, he really started the Potter's House with three basic members. Number four, they told the man that he would never make it in the ministry. Mm. Why? He has a heavy lift. And if you've ever been in his presence and really hear him, I mean, you'll hear the lift. Mm. So there I am, I'm at the Potter's House, his uh, administrative assistant grabs me, throws me in his study, saying the bishop will be with you shortly. Mm -hmm. Talking about a deep dive interview. And while I'm in his study, I, full throttle, am looking at every book on God's green earth that you would ever want to read, ever want to study, ever want to exam you know, examine in your life. And all of a sudden, while I'm looking at his books, taking a couple off the shelves, and blah, 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 bam, all of a sudden, Jake's walks in. And I said, Bishop, I'm not getting on that plane and flying back to Atlanta till we talk about success, till we talk about leadership, and till we discuss wealth. But before we do, I'm not going to cut the tape recorder off, but before we do, i got to ask you this question. Your critics say that you weren't going to make it in the ministry. And he said, Professor, my critics are all together, we're not together, all together wrong. He said, you know, the list is still there. No, I did not finish high school. But I don't care, I had something to say, and I don't care if I had to stutter, I don't care if I had to stammer, I was going to say it. I said, well, let me cut the tape recorder on now and you can talk to me. I said, what is the keynote to harmony when we discuss wealth? He says, that is, he says, give a man a fish, feed him for a day. Teach her how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. But show him or her how they can buy the pond and no one in their family will ever know struggle. Now, why would I share that story with you? Well, damn it, what the hell are you doing for four days? Yes, sir. You buying the pond. Yes. Mm -hmm. This man over here is teaching you how to buy the pond. And what happens when you bought the pond? Two things you never have to worry about in life. Number one, you never have to worry about employment. Why? Because the... You never have to worry about employment because everybody wants to be around game changers. Everybody wants to be around A-level people. That's why Steve Jobs only hired A-level people. And sometimes his HR director will go and say, Steve, we, we got a nice little, they're a little, little B-level, but they're nice and they'll fit into the culture. And Steve will wave his hand and says, no, I don't want them. Steve, how come you won't give B-level a chance? He says, easy. Because if I give B-level people a chance, sometimes they might feel sorry for C-level. And before I know it, my business will be overrun with B and C-level people, and we will forget the direction of this company. Let's go. Wow. So number one, you never have to worry about employment. And number two, which is critical, you never have to worry about wealth. You never have to worry about income. And there he is. Last final on there, here we go. Oh, where is it? There. 
going to sit back. Yeah. What are you looking at? You're in my office. Clark Atlanta University School of Business, room 318. And what is the last image these eyeballs, these 71 year old eyeballs see before I walk into the class and teach? You see the light switch. Before I go to class, I cut the lights off. I think green, I think sustainable. And the last image that the 71 year old I see is my icon. Let's get real, who's your icon? W.B. Du Bois. I have no problem sharing that with you. You ask Cornell West, you ask Michael Eric Dyson, you ask Skip Gates, they'll tell you the same thing because they told me. I asked Michael Eric Dyson, he was on campus a couple of months ago. Man, was your, Doc, call me Doc. You call me Doc, I call you Doc. <laughs> Gotta be like the boys. I asked Cornell West. Cornell West said, Doc, you know what I'm about, man. I'm all about 100% the boy. Walk to Harvard, sat down with Skip Gates. Don't oh, want to be like WB Du Bois. Might as well be the best in the business. Mm -hmm. So I got a picture of WB Du Bois. And under that picture are the following words DK, don't you ever forget, before you stand before your students today, your children, your kids, remember a poor teacher complains. A good teacher explains, an excellent teacher demonstrates, but a great teacher, a great teacher